we're uh, back to 1 Corinthians and we're uh, in chapter 3. We're going to finish the chapter, verse 16 to verse 23, remembering uh, who we are in the world. There's three things that Paul wants us to, to remember. Uh, and again, the, in, the, in the big picture of, uh, of 1 Corinthians, we kind of showed you a walk through the Bible, a uh, little uh, graphic a few weeks ago, uh, where there was one core Indian and he's spanking the saints, and that's what's going on in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and we're still uh, dealing with, uh, and will be for a, a few more times, uh, the first uh, and the uh, issue Paul spends the most time on, which is uh, division in the church. And it's because the church had become carnal uh, or worldly. Uh, uh, in the same way that before they were Christians, they would argue over Greek philosophy. Uh, and there were over 50 different schools of philosophy in Corinth at the time. Uh, they brought that same arguing and, uh, uh, and uh, cynicism and so forth right into their, their Christian experience. In other words, they just never, never really matured into having what we'd call a Christian worldview of things. Uh, it was uh, rooted in pride. Uh, it was creating uh, problems uh, in, in the church. Uh, and we've talked uh, a bit about the background to say that uh, Corinth in the first century, is uh, we're getting pretty close to that uh, in terms of the uh, immorality and how things were, uh, were there in terms of lifestyle and so forth uh, uh, of the conditions that we're living in today. There's a lot that we can uh, relate to here. Uh, and I just appreciate that Paul, <laughs> the Paul, the Paul doesn't just say, stop it, <laughs> you know, he actually says, would you come and kind of think through these things with me? Uh, and he says, let's, let's think about the cross uh, and what Christ has done for us uh, in our salvation by grace. And he says, and you might think about your own testimony. You know, not many of you were mighty or noble or anything. Think of what you were like when Christ came to you. Uh, and then uh, last time he said, and Let's talk about future reward. You know, we're all going to heaven. We're all going to have to stand before the Lord one day. So I just appreciate the fact that Paul, I mean, he had the authority as the founder of the church, as an apostle in the first century, as an author of, of uh, much of the New Testament, just to say, knock it off. Uh, but he, he really re tries to uh, get them to think through the issues uh, and why there should not be disunity. Uh, and he continues that here. And I've kind of, again, uh, broken this down into three things that we should be uh, remembering. And the first one uh, is uh, we must remember where God's Spirit dwells. And this is uh, uh, verses 16 and 17, uh, one of those verses you can read and kind of maybe miss uh, exactly what, what Paul is saying here. So we'll kind of break it down. But he says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple uh, you are. And there's a lot of language here like this where it's, you, know, you, you have a tendency to read it if you're like me and go, huh? And you kind of got to read it a couple of times. And what exactly is he saying here? But he's really saying that the, the church is where God's uh, spirit is, uh, is dwelling. The you here is not obvious to us in, uh, in English. It would be in King James. You have thee and thou. Uh, but here, it doesn't matter if it's you or you all. Uh, it's, it's plural. Uh, it's not singular. Uh, it's also interesting because of the word that he uses for temple is naos. Uh, and it doesn't mean the temple in general. He's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. He's talking about the holy place. He's talking about the place where only the priest could go. Uh, it was the place where God's spirit was, uh, where his presence was. Uh, it's a very particular place. So he's saying all of you together as the church are God's holy place. So again, late in the, later in chapter 6, uh, he'll make reference to the Holy Spirit dwelling in the individual believer. But that's, that's not what he's talking about here uh, at this point. He's just talking about how the church is a unique place where worship can occur. Can you worship alone? Is it, certainly you can. But Paul is saying there's something unique when believers gather together. They can because they are the naos. They become the holy place. God's spirit dwells with us corporately. And therefore, we can worship God, we can praise God, we can uh, enter into uh, to God's presence, again, in the same way the priest was able to uh, in, uh, in the holy place. Uh, but the problem here 
is that this is a carnal church. Uh, people are full of pride. Uh, they're arguing with each other. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of Peter, uh, and uh, and so forth. And it's creating uh, disunity. Uh, it's not holy the way it should be holy. And uh, Paul makes reference to this idea uh, certainly in more than one place. But in Ephesians, uh, he says this in chapter two, verse nineteen. Uh, of, of us in this dwelling place of God being in our midst. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. These are they're very similar things that we've already covered. In whom the whole building, uses the term building rather than temple here, being fitted together grows into a there, there is the same word, holy temple, the holy place uh, in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in, in the Spirit. Uh, Paul is saying something very important that I think we don't often realize, because we can come to church, and we come to church every week, and we can sing a couple of songs, and it can just really be Christian karaoke, because we got the songs, and we got the music, and we know the songs, and we can sing them. Uh, and we really forget the whole concept of what Paul is saying, that when we come together, if it's not carnal, if it's not rooted in pride, God's place, this place here, as we get together, it's not a building. We could be in a park, under a tent. It doesn't matter. God calls it and says that we're holy, uh, we're his holy place where his spirit dwells. That gives us this ability to uh, enter into his uh, presence. But the problem with the church there were, were the divisions. So Paul says, please remember that the church is where God's spirit dwells. And then he says, uh, the individual, though, here's the warning, the individual who defiles God's temple will be defiled himself. Uh, and that's in verse 17. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. That's very, pretty, pretty tough language there. Uh, and again, something that uh, needs a little bit of explanation. It's the same word, uh, whoever defiles will also be defiled. I'm not sure why it's translated destroy. Maybe uh, the translators here were trying to make a stronger point. Uh, but that word typically, uh, in many other places, is uh, never, never interpreted that way. It's always defile or, or corrupt. For example, um, Paul uses it again in chapter 15 of verse 33, where he says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts, that's, that's our word, corrupts good habits. The person that comes in and defiles God's holy church, local congregations that meet together for worship, and through division and pride and carnality, and creates issues, and they defile this holy thing that God has brought about through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. God says, I'll deal with that person. And, and we just went from plural to singular. Uh, we're in this corporately together, but anyone that does that, God says, I will, I will deal with them. And again, I don't I think destroy is, uh, is too strong, uh, but it's the idea. Again, usually translate it defile or, uh, or corrupt. Uh, again, let's read from 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Uh, this is the passage that deals with the individual and the idea that God's Spirit dwells within us. But I think it helps uh, make, make the point uh, and the concern uh, over the individual who would defile uh, God's holy church. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 uh, big issue, the next big issue is, is sexual immorality in, in the church. Uh, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body uh, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, <clears throat> whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So again, here the reference, the Holy Spirit being in the individual, uh, and therefore the individual, because God's spirit dwells within us, <clears throat> who is in you, whom you've received from God, you shouldn't defile. You shouldn't defile your body. Here is the context is you would defile it through sexual immorality, which was, of course, set rampant in the first century in Corinth in, uh, in particular. Uh, but it's a problem. God is saying that I've created you individually uh, because my spirit is in you and the church corporately, and I've made, made you holy. And you may feel like, well, 
I don't really feel holy. You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, in, uh, in the story of, uh, of Moses in the burning bush, you remember the story? Moses is, um, uh, he's on the backside of the desert there, having uh, fled uh, Egypt. Uh, and he uh, sees a bush that uh, is on the side of a mountain. It's on fire, but it's never consumed. Uh, more than a little curious, he hikes up to it. Uh, when he gets to this burning bush, uh, then God begins to speak to him audibly from the voice. And the first thing he tells him is, Moses, take off your sandals. The place you're standing is holy ground. Well, it was just the side of a hill before that, but God said it's holy, so get your sandals off. When God determines, it says, I've set something apart, it's our word sanctification, and I've done it, he's done it. And he does that with the church, Paul says, he does it with us uh, individually, and he's very concerned when we defile uh, what's holy in us, his spirit, individually, in this case through sexual immorality. He's very concerned and says, I will deal with anyone who comes in and defiles my holy church whether it's through division or, or whatever it is. Why? Because he says, I've determined, I've put my spirit in it, uh, and it's holy. One more reference over in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. Again, the same subject matter. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Again, being set apart. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. Same topic there as in uh, chapter 6. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. That's another reference to the temple. The vessels were in the holy place. The priest walked in. There was the, uh, the uh, table of showbread. There was the uh, altar of, uh, of incense. Uh, there was the, the menorah. Those were the vessels that were set apart that were in this holy place. It's that same kind of, kind of uh, language. Uh, vessels in sanctification and honor. Not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles, in this case, a term for unbelievers, who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. Let's see, saying the same thing uh, there again. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but rejects God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So again, the, uh, the subject is... Uh, believers being set apart, similar kind of language. The concern is sexual immorality in this case, as it is in chapter 6. In both cases, God says, I will deal with that person individually, but he says it in our text in terms of the church uh, itself. God will deal with the person who defiles his holy church. Over in Galatians 6, 7, one more warning there, uh, very familiar to you probably. God is, uh, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. And I kind of like the, the NIV there because it says, it says God, God cannot be mocked. It's just, it's not going to, it's not going to, to happen. And uh, one of the examples of this we see in the Old Testament and, um, is uh, with King David, of course, who fell into sexual sin uh, with uh, Bathsheba and then, of course, arranged for the murder of her husband, Uriah, who was a great... Uh, military hero and, uh, and leader in, uh, in the nation of Israel at that time. Uh, David tried to, all this to cover up his sin. Uh, and he says this uh, in the process in Psalm 32. When I kept silent in regards to his sin, my bones grew old through my groanings all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the draught of summer. He was being defiled. He was being dealt with by God. Of course, verse 5, thankfully, says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Uh, His mercies are new every morning, but uh, he says he will deal with uh, us individually. He will deal with uh, the church because it's holy, and he's put his Holy Spirit uh, in us. So the church is where God's Spirit dwells. Secondly, the individual who defiles God's uh, temple will be defiled himself. Why? Because it's a place of worship. Uh, it's a place of praise. It's a place where God's glories dwell. And, and God just doesn't want people messing that up. So people don't uh, misunderstand who he is and his character and so forth. And I just want to say there's a lot of that going on. 
It's one of the problems we have in our country right now. Uh, that's why we can, uh, and it was wonderful being at the apologetic conference uh, uh, with uh, all the kids on Friday night, and some of the folks were able to go back and be able to hear Os Guinness uh, in, uh, in person. This is a brilliant guy who uh, he, for uh, uh, many decades, have ministered to the, the whole body of Christ around the world, Oxford scholar, uh, just a wonderful opportunity to, to hear him. Uh, and basically, uh, Friday night, and he really changed his, uh, uh, his uh, message for Friday night, and, uh, and part of it had to do with the fact that, that there were so many, going to be so many young people. There were, uh, we had 20 kids there, and there was another youth group coming, and he, w- he really wanted to speak into their lives, to tell them, you're our last hope. You're our last hope, because it's a dark world. And, uh, and he describes some of it and what's going on. Of course, we can just watch the news uh, and, uh, and know, know that. And, uh, and he went through history, uh, and uh, as someone of his background can, and talked about the Roman Empire, talked about the aftermath, talked about the next wave of God that came through Western Europe and the next wave, and we need another one. He talked about the fact that there are many secular uh, historians that uh, say three things are going to happen into this world. These are secular thinkers, and many of, them, many of them believe the exact same thing because of the condition in the world now, because we've lost, the West has lost its moral pinnings that we've uh, hung on to for so long. He said, an empire will arise, maybe China, maybe Iran, maybe ISIS. They would all like to take over the world. An empire could arise, uh, or you will just see a series of failed nations around the world, like you have in Syria, like you have in Libya. These are failed nation states where there's just civil war and fighting, and that can spread over to the entire world. Or God will bring a revival, but he's only going to do that primarily through the people that can reach their own generations, those that are, you know, that 18 to 35-year-old, what he called the crunch generation. Uh, That's the world that we're living in, Uh, and we're in it because the church has become defiled, and God says, I'll, I will deal with it uh, when, that, when that happens. So we must remember, Paul says, in dealing with division, where God's Spirit uh, dwells. And uh, that defilement comes about, he says, through self-deception. That's the second thing we must remember. We must remember that we can be deceived by this world. Look at verse, uh, verse 18. There's two exhortations. This one is, let no one deceive, and there's another one later, let no one boast. But here he says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the, this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. Uh, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So, Uh, We're saying, do not be deceived by the wisdom of this world, based on uh, verse 18, uh, of a person who thinks he's wise in this age is actually uh, self-deceived. Notice verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with with God. Uh, The Greek uh, word that uh, uh, for fool or foolish there is moronic, where we get our word moron, and uh, and that's what the wisdom of this world uh, is. Uh, Human wisdom is foolish in the areas of spiritual truth. Uh, Paul is not talking about uh, business, mathematics, science, mechanics, your dentist, or anything else. Uh, But he is talking about being foolish in regards to the areas pertaining to God, the nature of God, the nature of man, the issues of salvation, uh, the inspiration of Scripture, uh, and so forth. Spiritual truth, uh, this world is, uh, is very foolish. Uh, when it comes to that. But, and we can become self-deceived and buy into worldly philosophies. There's supposed to be a contrast, should be a contrast between the church uh, and the world. Uh, in the world, people depend upon promotion, prestige, influence, money, uh, important people. The church depends on prayer, the power of the Spirit, humility, sacrifice, uh, and service. When believers look to the philosophies of this world instead of God's uh, word, it's a spiritual disaster. Uh, We need answers to problems uh, in relationship, marital problems, moral problems, and we need to turn to God's Word uh, and not to the philosophies of this world. It is the standard of the truth, but this is one of the big issues. Uh, We've lost the standard of God's truth. Uh, There's there's just a 
huge percentage of people that call themselves evangelical Christians in our country today that no longer even believe in the inspiration of, uh, of, uh, of, God's, uh, of God's Word because they've really bought into the whole relativism thing. They've had it kind of pounded into them all the way through our education system, and it's taken its toll. But listen to what the writer of Hebrews says about God's Word in our personal problems. He says in Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is living and active, Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And I just want to tell you, uh, any person you sit down with, with a professional degree, uh, with the very best intentions and all the training that they have, they will never be able to judge between your thoughts and your attitudes accurately. They just won't be able to do it. But God's Word can and yet uh, where there's a great departure from it. Uh, we become self-deceived when we, when we buy into the things of this world and the way uh, things are done. Uh, <clears throat> and um, and I, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, there, there is entire movements uh, of the church that are, that are rooted in basic business practices. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, more popular Christian writers uh, who's had a hand in starting churches all across the country. His mentor is a guy that's into Zen Buddhism, uh, but he is a great business mind and has a great marketing background, and he's helped him establish these churches all over. Well, well that's uh, exactly what Paul's warning, warning about. But everybody seems to be okay uh, with, uh, with that. Uh, again, what happens then is that uh, even in the business world, uh, a businessman can, uh, can rather than follow God's uh, keys that he gives throughout the Proverbs, throughout uh, his word, in terms of his own business practice and his own ethics and so forth, he can be successful for a time, but eventually, uh, without the underpinnings of God's word, uh, it impacts the spiritual life and your testimony is uh, undermined. Remember, when we, Kathy and I were first married, uh, and uh, we were both self-employed, and she had her dressmaking uh, business, and uh, I was doing stained glass work, and we would, we would uh, it was a little feaster, feaster fathom, you know, sometimes, and it was tough with both of us uh, being uh, self-employed, and, um, and uh, we would, uh, I mean, I was doing mostly commission stuff, so I mean, I'd get a big commission, a lot of money coming in, nothing, <laughs> then, you know, we'd kind of go back and forth. We had, to, we had to really learn to, uh, to trust, trust the Lord. Uh, somebody, uh, and uh, during that time period, I, I would do some uh, workshops and seminars, and, and um, people would come to want to see uh, what I was doing and so forth, and people would ask me um, that uh, would like to do what I was doing and be able to do it full-time. They'd say, well, uh, what do you what do you do? You know, when you don't have enough business, or how do you how do you generate uh, business so that you can, you know, be a, an artist like that and be able to uh, earn a living and uh, and so forth? And I said, well, when um, when we don't have any business come in, then uh, we we fast and we pray. That's that's well. What do, what do you mean by that? That means we don't eat on certain meals on certain days, and we pray instead, and we ask God to bring us business. And uh, we ask real hard and seriously sometimes, and then he does. Uh, that, by the way, seems like foolishness to, to a lot of people in the world, right? I mean, that's what Paul's saying. There are, there are biblical principles of how we, that, govern, that are supposed to govern our life, and these will seem moronic to people uh, outside uh, the church that don't know the Lord. The question is, do we abandon them so that we can be more accepted, maybe in a different uh, setting or a different venue? Think about the uh, church in the book of Acts. They owned no property. They had no influence in government. They had no treasury. Remember Peter? Silver and gold have I none. Uh, their leaders were ordinary men. They did not have a formal education. I'd say they had a great educa education under Jesus, but they didn't have uh, the, uh, the accepted education of, of the day. Uh, in order to build the church, they ran no contest. <laughs> they brought in no celebrities, uh, and they turned the world upside down. Uh, and it was all through the, God's principles, holding to God's word and the power of the Spirit. Now, we've already alluded to this, but uh, just to make this point, 
Secondly, deception comes when our thinking is not grounded in God's word. It's very subtle, but it's in verse 18. If anyone among you seems, seems to be wise in this age, seems to, means to reason or, or to think. Uh, in this case, the reasoning and thinking is apart from God's word. If any of you among you begin to reason and think apart from God's word, uh, you're going to be uh, in trouble. Uh, when God's word is no longer our standard of, of truth. Uh, and um, I don't uh, read uh, quotes often from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, John MacArthur, but uh, I, because I, I, I agree with a lot of what he wrote 25 years ago, but not so much that recently. But uh, I thought this was very interesting, and I just want to emphasize the doctor, uh, John MacArthur. Uh, he says, the person who elevates his own wisdom will always have a low view of Scripture. The person who elevates his own wisdom will always have a low view of Scripture. But the more important truth is that God knows the value of that person's own wisdom. It is foolishness, stupid, totally unreliable, uh, and useless. So says Dr. John MacArthur. Uh, That's God's view uh, of the wisdom of the world. He calls it moronic. Uh, That's the term that uh, that Paul is, is using here. When we begin to have a high view of our own views, we begin to have a very low view uh, of, of Scripture. And again, our, our, uh, our believers doing that today, we, we mentioned um, evolution, Darwinian evolution a, a few weeks ago, uh, and how much, much of the church has made tremendous compromise uh, in, in this area uh, in order to be, to be accepted. Because uh, right now, and there's been some documentaries that... Uh, have, uh, have shown this, that uh, uh, if you're in the scientific or academic community and they find out that you believe in intelligent design, you're going to lose your job. Uh, I mean, you, know, uh, it's, uh, you don't even have to hold the view. In one case, the guy just wrote an editorial quoting somebody else, and he lost his job as the editor for a scientific journal. Uh, it's, there's a, a battle that's going on uh, out there today. Of course, one of the bigger issues today is the whole issue of uh, of homosexuality and the desire for society to accept homosexuality. And there was a, uh, a news story uh, just this week that kind of caught my attention. Interesting, it came up in the uh, question and answer period uh, yesterday or Friday evening at the uh, conference uh, involving, involving uh, Manny Pacquiao. Now, you may not, uh, he's a boxer, he's also a politician, and he's running uh, for, uh, uh, I think, a Senate seat in the, uh, in the Philippines. And uh, in the interview, he made uh, uh, references to uh, his uh, Christian faith and his view uh, in regards to homosexuality. Uh, and because of that, uh, he was just roasted in the press, and, uh, and Nike uh, cut him off uh, completely. Now, I'm going to use him as an example uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, one is to say that uh, it's difficult but we actually do have to take a stand for our biblical values. There's a world out there that is completely intolerant of anything other than their views. That's the new tolerance. The new tolerance is agree with us or we will, we will attack you personally. And uh, we have a whole set of adjectives uh, all stored up here uh, to be used for you. And those all came out against uh, Manny Pacquiao. Now, what did he do? Somebody asked him about the issue of homosexuality, homosexual uh, marriage. He responded, and he started off very well. (laughs) He said, uh, and expressed what we would call natural theology or a naturalistic worldview. He said, well, if you look in nature, you don't see homosexuality. You don't see it among among the animal world. Now, he's the reason that that's a, a good argument is because uh, the people you're trying to talk with uh, don't uh, believe in the Bible, so you can't uh, just start, quote the Bible. So you appeal to a naturalistic worldview in terms of what you see out there. Now, they would combat and say, well, that's not true completely. Uh, there are times in nature where you do see same-sex animals together. Uh, and they like to bring that up. And that's a very good point. And when that happens in nature, we say that's an oddity. That's completely unusual. So uh, he starts out very good. And he, he uses an argument that could be used with anybody, even if they do not accept uh, the Bible as God's word. Then he makes a huge mistake. 
And this I, I want to be clear on. So then, unfortunately, he, he doesn't stop there in this interview. Uh, and he goes on and then says, and that's why the animals are better than the homosexuals. Well, that's degrading. Uh, you've, you've, you've just slighted the very people you're trying to reach. He began with a good argument. It's a good argument. They have a counter. There's a good counter uh, back to it. But you, you can't insult the people you're trying to uh, reason with uh, and so forth. So uh, Nike did uh, drop him in the quote from a paper from the Philippines. They said, we find Manny Pacquiao's comments abhorrent. Nike, uh, Nike strongly opposes discrimination of any kind has a long history of supporting and standing up for the rights of the LGBT community. The company said in a statement yesterday, we'll no longer have a relationship with Manny, Manny Pacquiao. But he started out well, and, uh, because here, here's the issue, and we, we've talked about it briefly before on other occasions, uh, and it's one that is not going to go away uh, in the near future in terms of the, the uh, LGBT community. <clears throat> Their whole mantra for 20 years has been, what we, what we do... Is, is normal, it's healthy, it's accepted. Normal, healthy, accepted. Say it again with me, class. This is what kids, kids, your kids, if they're in public school, some private schools are completely indoctrinated into this view from as low as first, first, second, third grade, right, right on through. That's why in the polling, uh, even, even uh, uh, evangelical Christians that are in their 20s now, are, they, they have no issues with, uh, uh, with gay, gay marriage and so forth. They've, uh, they've had 20 years of indoctrination. The problem is, uh, is that it's not healthy. That's what they say, but it's, it's not healthy. Uh, and, um, and that's where our heart should, if you, if you, and no show of hands, but I mean, there's probably the majority of us that have somebody that's gay that we know, or a family member, or whatever, and hey, if you know, then your heart goes out to them. It's, that is, this is, there's nothing, as I said, there's nothing gay about being gay. This is a tough, very difficult life. Very, very unhealthy. If you want to find out how unhealthy it is, go down to, uh, go down to donate blood and look at the questionnaire. I mean, they, 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 are, they are so much more prone to uh, a number of diseases and so forth and uh, battle with depression. It's difficult. If you, if you, uh, these are folks that need, need the love of Jesus Christ de- desperately. But, but they get the wrong message sometimes that somehow we don't like them, we hate them, uh, it, which is you know, far from the truth. Uh, but it's not healthy, uh, and uh, it's actually not, not normal either, less than 2%, even after all the indoctrination and so forth, but it's being accepted. They, they've, but they, uh, this is the mantra. Uh, when we stand for biblical value, we could talk about other philosophies of the world, uh, and there's going to be a contrast, and Paul says there's always going to be a contrast between the wisdom of this world uh, and the wisdom of God. Uh, and God doesn't think a lot of the wisdom of the world, but uh, we get caught up into it through uh, self-deception uh, when our thinking is not grounded in God's Word. Thirdly, deception will prevent us from becoming wise because he gives the solution here in verse 18. Let him become a fool that he may become wise. Verse 19 warns that man's uh, wisdom is uh, uh, only a trap. Uh, how do you become a fool? What he's talking about? He's just talking about humility. He's talking about humility, a fool in the world's eyes, just uh, it's humility. Uh, so it's being grounded in God's word with some humility. Uh, it's what we do, it's what we know, it's what we remember, but it's the attitude that we have. And then he quotes Job 5.13. Here uh, God is speaking uh, to Job in uh, chapter 5 verse 12, I'll back up one verse, he says, uh, uh, he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. He says, uh, uh, it, this, God sees everything that's going on here. None of this is escaping his attention. And then he quotes Psalm 94, 11, where he says, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they're futile. So verse 20 warns that man's wisdom only leads to vanity and to futility. Uh, the church must identify with the needs of the world, uh, but we're in trouble if we begin to accept and imitate the wisdom of the world. So we need to remember where God's Spirit dwells in the church. It's His holy place. Secondly, we need to remember that we can be deceived by, by this world. And uh, 
and uh, it's not wise, and uh, it's just getting crazier all the, all the time out there. I don't know if you keep up with, with all of this, but uh, I heard one statistic from uh, Danny the other night. Right now, if you um, register uh, with Google, and you're going to register with them, for your sexuality, it used to say male, female, there are now 50 categories. If you are going to register to attend the University of California at any of their campuses, and there's a place where you could choose to check male or female, there are 20 categories. Because, you know, the Olympics right now are trying to figure out whether they're going to allow teams uh, in the next Olympics to compete that have men that think they're women. Well, I, I could see that going badly right away. It's like... You want to win a gold medal? Just get the 12 biggest guys we got. They play volleyball really good. Let's go. Uh, it's unfair. It's unfair to the gals. It, it's just so, so extreme. This is the wisdom uh, of the world. It's just, uh, uh, we're just seeing it you know, in the extreme forums now. Uh, then, and thirdly, we must remember that God has given us far more than we deserve. Uh, if we want to end disunity, carnality in our lives and in God's holy church, we need to remember that he's given us far more than we deserve. And that's verse 21 and 23. Therefore, let uh, no one boast in men, <clears throat> for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. So we should uh, not be boasting, he says, in human leaders uh, in verse 21. Therefore, let no one boast in men. That's what they were doing, of course. And these men were a great blessing. Pretty awesome to have Peter as your Bible study leader, right? I mean, to sit under Paul's teaching for, uh, for a, a year and a half. Apollos, I mean, they, uh, we don't have his writings, but what they say about him, he was just uh, an amazing orator and uh, tremendous in God's word. What a blessing. But they were using that as a, a divisional point between them. God's teachers, they all taught the same, the same truth. Uh, and again, uh, and this all began in verse 31 of chapter 1, he who glories, let him glory in, in the Lord. They're just all God's servants. Uh, don't extol one, one above the other. Don't, don't divide over these things. Don't allow personal preferences, which is fine. We, uh, we could go around and we probably, uh, of the guys we listen to on the radio and so forth, we probably all have our favorites and some of those are going to overlap because there, there's pers personalities. God speaks through personalities and uh, and that's fine, but it's not to be a, div a divisive thing. Uh, it's something that God's given us. God's given us gifted teachers, and uh, uh, more than uh, more than ever before. I mean, in terms of the accessibility to uh, who uh, hear whoever you, you want. I I listen to Ravi Zacharias every Sunday morning on on the, on the way here, uh, and do my best not to uh, say the same thing he just said on the radio because uh, so awesome. Uh, secondly, we should realize that all things belong to us. Uh, that's in verse 21, the second half. All things are yours. Uh, and of those all things, uh, Paul mentions six things. And I think this will be a blessing to you. One, the world itself belongs to us. That's the, included in the all things are yours. In, or in verse 22, right be, uh, after that, he says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world. That's the term for cosmos. Uh, it's, uh, it's the world itself. And um, it's pretty amazing to look at those stars at night on those clear nights or like Greg and Stephanie got to go see those northern lights and realize our God made that. It's different. It's just different when you, when you realize that, it, that it's ours, uh, that it was our Father that, that spoke it uh, into existence. It's true now, but certainly it will be true in a greater degree when Jesus Christ returns and establishes his millennial kingdom here uh, here on earth. One writer said, the believer can appreciate the world as no unbeliever can. We know where it came from, why it was made, why we are on it, and what its final destiny will be. That, that makes a huge difference in, uh, in looking at the world. It belongs to us, Paul says. Uh, secondly, the circumstances of life belong to us. Again, all things are yours. What he's saying here is that whatever comes your way, whatever the circumstances are, uh, they're yours. 
they're yours for a purpose. God is behind it. He's sovereignly uh, directing the, uh, uh, the events of your life. This is very similar of what he says in Romans 8, 28, of course. And we know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. So uh, we have in that verse and in this little statement here, uh, two things that we can have tremendous confidence in. Uh, the one in uh, Romans is, and we can have confidence because of what we know. The, the we know means knowledge by facts. It's not uh, by experience. It's not what we feel. The word and, and we know, connects it with the previous statement. Because we know God's grace. Uh, the chapter begins, uh, there is not, therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. It ends and nothing can separate us from the love that uh, uh, that is in God. Nothing can separate us. And because we, we know, we know the facts of that. And those, those facts come to bear on our circumstances when things are not going well for us. Uh, when we get that call from the doctor, uh, when we get that call from our boss, whatever the, the news is, it, it hits us uh, sometimes and it impacts us emotionally. And we feel bad and we feel depressed and we wonder. Uh, and uh, it, 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 uh, it does things to us physically sometimes So when the news is very bad. But then we know. There's facts, though, that override my emotions that I can look at and know. I don't know how, but I know that somehow, some way, if this has come in my life, it's only become because God's allowed it. And if he's allowed it, he's got a purpose in it. I don't see what it is now, but I'm going to trust the facts. I'm going to ask God to help me get through the emotion and the feeling that I'm feeling right now. We know, I, as, um, just to point out, it's in a perfect tense. It means that uh, it's, it's happened in the past, it's stated in the past, but it has continual results all the way into the future. This will always be the case for us uh, as, as believers. We have a hope in the future because of the cross of Christ and His grace alone. And, uh, and it's uh, because we're saved by grace, no condemnation, nothing can separate us. We can have confidence in the ultimate good that will come in terms of the circumstances of our, of our lives. Uh, Dr. Barnhouse says that uh, uh, there is no will or active creatures, men, angels, or demons that can do other things then work for our good. No dog can bark against us. No man can speak or act against us. No sinister power of evil can be against us, but all must be for our good. All things work together for our good. Otherwise, the Lord would not permit it. So again, God has two purposes in this, uh, and that is our good, eternal good, and His glory. Not that everything is good that happens to us, but God uses it for good. Thirdly, all life belongs to us. Again, from the context, Paul's referring to our spiritual life, to eternal life. In Christ, we have a, a new life. It's a different life. He says in John 10, 10, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more uh, abundantly. I know sometimes we, as we're praying for friends and family members that don't know the Lord, it, it, uh, we begin to contemplate and think uh, how just how difficult life would be not not knowing the Lord. You know, I, I like the uh, uh, the line that uh, uh, a guy comes to the uh, uh, pastor that I know, and and he's just you know college student. He's a brand new Christian. He was just saying you know with all that uh, he's dealing with in school and so forth, the difficulty of being being a Christian, you know, in his uh, his circumstances and setting. And he said to him very wisely, "Oh, really? You should try being a non-Christian. Uh, that's no, that's hard." Because you, you have no relationship with the Lord. You have no prayer life. You have no hope. You have no future. When bad things happen to you, it's just a bummer, dude. <laughs> it's, there, there is no relying, looking back to, but what are the facts that can override my circumstances and my heart and mind at this juncture where I can trust in the Lord? There's, there's none of those things. There's not the abundant life uh, in Christ. Uh, four is uh, even in death. Death belongs to us. I like what one writer said, all death can do is deliver us to Jesus. That's, it's, uh, that's all it's got. It's, it's not the same. It's not the same for us. Things present belong to us. And that encompasses everything we experience in, in life, the good and the bad, the pleasant, uh, the painful. Uh, later in that passage in Romans 8 and verse 37, Paul writing says, yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, 
nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The sixth thing that comes to us, uh, it belongs to us, uh, things belong to us. Uh, and again, uh, really speaking about the future, our heavenly blessing here. You know, material things don't mean that much the longer you walk with the Lord. Uh, but six things, Paul says, that uh, belong to us as believers. We should remember these things. And then the fourth one, very briefly, verse 23, and you are Christ and Christ is God. So uh, there's one that we belong to, these things that, uh, that have come to us, but we belong to the Lord. Uh, when we take our eyes off of him, division occurs. When we get our eyes back on him, uh, that division ends. We need to remember where God's spirit dwells uh, in the church his holy place. Uh, we need to remember that we can be deceived by the world. Uh, and, and the world is just getting stranger all the time. That's why we need to really hold to God's word uh, and hold to it with a humble attitude. And then lastly, <clears throat> we must remember that God has given us far more than we deserve. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your, your grace. And just a quick <laughs> Quick rundown through six things that uh, we do not deserve, but you've given to us. Lord, and we so appreciate them. Lord, we pray that uh, the church, our church, would be a holy place as you intend. Uh, it would not be defiled. Lord, but it would be a place where uh, praise uh, originates from, uh, where we can kind of leave the busyness and the world behind and just put our thoughts and our mind on you. Uh, Lord, this is just like the best environment we're going to be in until we're in heaven. Lord, just to be with other believers and worship you and uh, sit under your word and have it encourage and instruct and exhort. Lord, and um, Lord, may you fill this place in our hearts uh, with your presence and with your love each and every time uh, we come in to worship. May our hearts be right before you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.